Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Welcome uh, to the uh, yes. Northland Candidates Night, sponsored by the Northland Republican Town Committee. Uh, this is a special night for our town, uh, simply because this is what helps the community grow, be managed, and uh, do good to the um, uh, individuals stepping forward to represent uh, the, the town needs. Okay. First, uh, I would like to start off with the Pledge of Allegiance.
get back to these students. It's unbelievable. And you know, it's very difficult to pick out who should be the recipient because you get you get tugged by by the passion and, and, and the understanding and, and the appreciation that students do have. And it also reminds us as you know, the, even when I grew up, you say, oh, kids today. <laughs> That's my generation, they said that. Well, every generation gets picked up that way, don't they? And the kids today, they, 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 when they articulate their, their feelings for the play. Um, it, it's heartwarming. And it's good to know that the youth of America thinks about the country in a very positive way. So thank you. If you'd be so kind, we have a basket that's going around, we do some donations and so on. Um, uh, I mean, has it, the audience going to have that in that regard. So if, if you do that, that would be uh, so kind. The award that we give is $750. So that's, that's a decent uh, scholarship. So, but let us, not, uh, let us go forward and uh, let's, let's talk about the um, uh, candidates. All right. We have for our first speaker, and we, uh, John Murphy, who is the town moderator, uh, he will give you an idea of what um, uh, what town moderator does, how they have to work in and make sure that everyone follows the four corners uh, of the rules. And, but I'll, he will articulate it by far much better than I do. John?
preside over town meeting. And I got the green light. And 18 years later, I'm still doing it. Um, Barbara beat me to the punch. Barbara retired in October. And I said, I am absolutely unequivocally going to run again. Because I think it's important for the community to have that continuity. And we have a new uh, town clerk. And uh, Susan, who is incredible. I was blessed to be included in the hiring process, in interviewing, over Zoom, <laughs> with COVID. But, um, so it's been great. Um, but let's talk about town meeting for a minute. As I said earlier, purest form of democracy. Any registered voter can attend. Any guest or visitor can attend. If a guest or visitor wants to speak, I get to decide. <laughs> if a registered voter wants to speak, they can speak only when called upon. Not stand up and stop shouting and screaming. And it's a it's a it's sometimes a tough role because there are deep passions on certain artists. But um, I've enjoyed all 18 years of it. Um, we've been able to accomplish um, most town meetings in one night. And uh, everybody gets to say their piece. There's a five minute limit. Um, I follow the, the uh, US Constitution Commonwealth of Massachusetts, the town charter, and the town bylaws in making all of my decisions. I have a great team behind me in the Board of Selectmen um, and the support of town council. And um, it's, I enjoy it. It's governed by Robert's Rules of Order. Um, I announced the sort of the, the rules and the protocols up front at the beginning of town meeting. And um, it's, it's just been a wonderful job. But the, the best part of it is I'm not political anymore. Because I'm in Switzerland. I'm standing at the podium. Not tonight. Well, yeah, tonight I'm Switzerland too. Um, but I don't have to, I don't have to opine. And I stay out of, for the most part, town politics. I do have a wife. I do have a daughter who lives in town now who's a taxpayer, and her husband, and my grandson. So I won't get involved in their politics, and I won't tell them what to do with their politics. But I am Switzerland, and it, it, it's kind of fun, because you get to watch from afar. Having spent three years on the board of selectmen being in the thick of it, and now get to just kind of sit back and say, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> but I don't get to weigh in. I keep my opinion to myself. Um, so again, uh, if you've not been to town meeting, uh, I would encourage you to go. And uh, if you have been to town meeting, hopefully you're happy with my performance. And uh, I ask for your support on May 2nd. And uh, I look forward to another term. Sherry's moderator in town of North River. May 3rd. <laughs> Okay, my calendar's broken. <laughs> You'll be early. I've been busy. <laughs> so, uh, thank you all. Thanks for taking the time to be here. Well, not for, just for me, but for all the candidates. And uh, I love this town, and I'm committed to this town, and I'll be here a long time. Especially with my grandson down the road. Thank you all. <laughs> 18 years, we knew. Right? A long time. Uh, but he's done a super job. Uh, it was um, tough to follow Klaus. Right? He was, uh, uh, been there, he was there 20 years. It was tough to follow him uh, at, that, at that time because no one knew. You know, we were so used to uh, Klaus that uh, um, he didn't know. He, he's done a super job. And, and uh, I thank you for all the years that you have done this. You've done town meeting justice. Also, uh, next, so we have, uh, from the Community Plan Commission, we have uh, Robert Pierce. Uh, unfortunately, David Rudolph is away. Regrets, as he says, uh, our business is unable to attend. 
but uh, more impressive and give you an idea of uh, what the CPC does and his role. And more impressive is one of the most knowledgeable people at this time. Uh, welcome. Thank you. general housing for people, but elderly housing and affordable housing. So there's a lot of pushes going on right now by the state trying to get more housing, especially more affordable housing. Um, and we're involved, obviously, in that process. When we do um, when we do subdivisions, we generally try to get them to give us at least one affordable unit, assuming that the project is large enough to, to uh, do that. And that's in our attempt to continue to chip away at that 10 percent. Town, the state wants a town to have at least 10% of their housing to be affordable. If it's not, then we open ourselves up to, to things like 40 b which is when the state can allow somebody to come in and build uh, buildings. And we move that 40 b to the next floor. Uh, and so it's really kind of important that we hold on to our affordable housing, uh, uh, which includes the, uh, the property over at the ferry center. So, uh, If you look at over the years, Route 28 has been a problem ever since we've tried to, try to make it look, try to turn it into something that looks a little better than just a, a run down the road. And over the years, we've managed to do a bit of that. If you look at the intersection of Wall Road and, and uh, 28, if you look at how that corner got all opened up and it's nice, high quality, it's pretty. Uh, same thing on the other end of town with Park Street and, and, and uh, Main Street. That was pretty good now. And uh, we we'll continuously trying to make sure that the project said well, it's being done, get done well. Uh, Walmart is a favorite subject of mine because when Walmart came in, by the way, Walmart didn't just decide to come here. The way we got Walmart was Stop the Shop. Stop the Shop did a, uh, a very elaborate traffic study about to see how, it, what, how many customers they could get and whether it was building this stuff. So we borrowed it and sent it off to Walmart. We said, look, look at this traffic count, look at all these people. And they said, wow, we can put a store here. And we did. Now, that's how we got Walmart. Well, when they came in, they had this ugly building that was horrible. And, uh, and we didn't have it. But we actually encouraged them to do a little better in how they did that. We told them basically what to do. Uh, it was interesting on the grand opening, they put credit for it. But that's okay. We're not going to talk about it. And they, they gave us a bit of grief about 
of that building, but when it was all built to death, it was used for another copy that building style and three or four other areas because it came out so well. So it was worth, worth putting the effort. So um, that is what we're beginning. I'm going to go through the years and I'm going to say another two of these. Uh, I, I do enjoy the work. I like seeing the results of the work. Again. I like seeing the town grow and the productive in the way. In a way that uh, makes it look a little prettier, a little better, uh, kind of some of the driving up and down that street. So. But I also want to say about a couple of things about uh, there are a number of people that are running out of votes here. And while um, you may go in and say, well, you know, I don't need to vote for them because they're, you know, they're out of votes. But, uh, but I wish you would think about this because I, I want you to cast your vote based on whether how you feel about the job of this country. Because that's one of the things they can tell. If the, uh, if a particular person gets a large number of votes, uh, even though they're running out of votes, then these people approve of the job they do. So if you approve the job that any one of these candidates is doing, give them your vote, even if they're on the vote. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, very informative. Uh, does anybody have a question uh, for Warren in regard to uh, anything coming up? Or for Jeff. No? Yes, in the back. My question. Um, I noticed like Reading on 28 had um, changed the traffic pattern and all that. And, and uh, North Reading seems to have, you know, a drag race going on like all the time on their four wheel. Is there anything in the works that we're working on any of that? Anybody look at the book? Yeah, we've actually, uh, we've actually looked at it. We had a study that was done. We've not actually looked at it. We're doing something similar to it. We're making it a three lane. That is two lanes and then a turn lane in the middle. Uh, so I think there's a feasibility of that. But of course, what we're trying to do is um, um, put, put together a plan that, that accomplishes that goal. But we're trying to uh, have it done simultaneously with the installation of sewer. Because we're going to take the road up and repave it, revive it well, do it on the new sewer. So if we can get the sewer project to go on a little bit, and during the process of doing that, I would imagine that we'll be able to do the road because we have talked about that, and it is a good, it is a good plan. It does work very well now. Thank you. Does anybody else have a question? Okay. Thank you again.
moved here, I was commuting to Hull, <laughs> where I grew up. It was quite a commute, and when I had my daughter, I decided it was a little too much. So I started working here in town, raised my kids. Um, when they got older, I got into more of a corporate salon. Um, but I, I, yeah, it was worth people, which I just said, you know, more corporate. Um, and then moved on to Newbridge on the Charles in Dedham and was managing that. Uh, five salons in there, I was managing. Um, and then decided to get certified for memory care and Alzheimer's dementia training. And so now I run salons at Artists in Reading and in Lexington. So I'm now self-employed doing that. So I have a lot of business knowledge um, the reason I wanted to run on the board, my, my kids were older, uh, not that I had a lot of time. <laughs> Nobody on the board has a lot of time. <laughs> we're all very busy, but you make the time when you want to give back. You just make it. Um, when we were raising the kids, we had the opportunity to build a home. Um, we were already in a home and were able to build a home. I went before CPC, I went before we're in here, it's very tough. <laughs> back then. And it was just interesting to me. It just always stayed in my head, all the boards we went in front of and how it worked. And um, I just felt like a little nudge to, to be involved in that. So that's kind of what made me, part of what made me take that step. The first time I ran was with Mr. Walner and we both lost. <laughs> um, but it was two incumbents, so we didn't feel too bad. Um, and then Ironically, we both decided to run again, what, six years later, for the same piece? The same piece, right? Same piece. Um, I, I never even talked about it, but we both stepped up, and we both won. So, <laughs> And I just feel like I, I thought about, did I want to run again? Did I want to, because it really is time consuming. Um, we have such a camaraderie. Our board works so well together. Even with our very different ideas and our very different beliefs, we are all very respectful of each other and we all work so well together that I felt like I didn't want to mess that up. I didn't want that to, to change. So I decided to continue on. So I hope that I will get to vote, even though I know I don't have anybody running against me, but it would still be nice to to get your vote and like Warren said, just to feel like you know, you think that I'm doing a good job. So um, I hope that you'll give me that on the third. Say? <laughs> the third. <laughs> so thank you. I'll, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Nothing. All right. They're all here for the select board. <laughs> So uh, next is uh, Richard Walner. I guess you now know his story because the aunt told you his story. <laughs> but um, uh, at least that portion of it. Uh, but uh, uh, I, I've worked with Richard, you know, on many different occasions. He's a passionate person about uh, North Reading. He, he has a vision for North Reading. Uh, has, has some ideas, and uh, I think uh, hopefully he'll be able to share some of them you know, with you tonight. But uh, he loves North Reading, and, 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 and I may say, I think everybody here loves North Reading, and that's why we're here. So I just want to uh, have you come in, speak, and let everybody know what you think. Sure. So when you vote, uh, Leanne and I count up the votes after this to find out who's going to vote. I love competitions. I think I won the last time, so if you give her more votes this time, I'm going to work this time. A formal statement, then I'd love to take some questions. So, uh, my name is Rich Walner, and I'm running for the second term on the select board because the board, along with the town administrator, have found productive ways to work together, and because I want to continue to bring forward ideas that will improve the quality of life for everyone in our town. Examples include improving access to the Swan Pond area, which is something we're in the process right now, improving Marcus Pond, which we uh, did a whole weed control just recently, 
And then uh, I'm sure some of you heard we're proposing a recreational trail that has been in the works for the last five, six years, which would be a great amenity for our town that many people don't even know we already have a trail in the town that we just don't have necessarily. Um, I support social issues such as working with the Council of Aging, which I've done for 10 years. Uh, Commission on Disabilities, which is meeting right now in downtown. We have a whole new uh, uh, squad of people who are very enthusiastic. Uh, we're, we're reaching far and wide. We, have, we already have some um, uh, people from, from the town already starting to attend. You're going to hear a lot more from us as we make progress. Uh, tax aid committee is, uh, has two warrants on the article. Um, it's, it's, it's coming from the assessor's office, but it's also sourced from the tax aid committee help our seniors stay in place and not leave and to take care of our vets as well. Um, I'm also, um, we're going to be working on creating a transportation committee because one of the biggest things our seniors have as a problem with town is we don't have transportation uh, that they can use and we need to get better at doing that. So that's something we're working on. Um, I also support, uh, you know, while we're talking about schools, I strongly support the need for diversity education in our schools because our kids want and need to be prepared for a world of many colors and uh, different types of people. As we saw so wonderfully expressed by our students in the transcript on March 31st, that those are compelling words that we should all pay attention to. Uh, here's a major concern. However, after 10 years of collaborating and study on this topic, our demographics are changing. We are one of the fastest growing communities of seniors in Massachusetts, yes, yet our seniors are being pushed out due to high property taxes lack of services, and lack of age-appropriate community gathering places. Why is it important to keep our seniors, why is it important to keep our seniors in town? Here is one fiscal reason. It takes the property taxes from two empty nesters homes to pay the cost of sending just one child to our schools. So it takes three homes to send one child to school. One child can only live in one home. It takes the extra two homes to make us uh, let the kids go to school. That's how much it costs. Second, our seniors helped to create the town we enjoy so much today. We owe them our gratitude and support. Unfortunately, recent studies show that only 60% of our rising senior parents, and let me define what that means, parents whose kids are graduating and are becoming empty nesters themselves, only 60% of those rising senior parents intend to stay in town. This is an alarming stat because the state average is 80%. And it's a compelling indicator that we must take active steps now to give these rising seniors reason to stay in our town, but we risk decimating the schools and our community if they leave. And that can happen in the next 10 to 15 years. That's how close this is coming. Uh, the select board understands this and has already decided to fill a long, vacant role of public services director to help lead the way, but there is so much more we need to do. That has been one of my primary focuses for the last 10 years. Um, other issues that are very important for the select board coming up is obviously the sewage. How are we going to pay for that? What's the return on investment? These are, you know, this, this is going out many, many years that we're making decisions now that we have to uh, get our arms around and think through and we have good people who are working on, on the select board. And facilities, we have a need to expand our uh, fire station and we have to do it in an economical way that will work. Uh, for everybody, and uh, we have other needs. You know, the town hall is not looking so great. The shelves fall off the walls. You know, there's many issues, and I know that facilities master planning committee is working hard on that as well. So these are issues that um, you know it's going to come become come before the select board in the next few years. Um, I certainly have a voice, as everybody else does. And again, as Leanne said, we're working really well today. Um, I have a long resume. If you want to see it, it's on LinkedIn. I don't want to take up much time to do that, so I'm happy to give that to you later. If you want to learn more about the Age Friendly, um, just go to the NORCAM Facebook page and, and just search on Age Friendly presentation, and I'll bore you for an hour and a half, but it's good information for you. I'd love to take some questions. Okay, uh, as I mentioned, that at each group, we open it up to any questions, and so we have a select board and an opportunity to ask some questions. You just heard a lot information. Uh, there should be some questions here. Uh, yes? Uh, my name is Rick Stratton, 60 and Marshall. Um, I just have a question about, um, you mentioned you're concerned about the senior population, which 
we're members of. Uh, I just wonder if there's any plans before the board of selectmen, uh, select board, excuse me, um, to develop another senior center, a new senior center. Yeah, the, the, um, the, uh, uh, many years ago we defined that uh, there was there was going to be a um, the senior center is what it is, and uh, uh, probably eight years ago we defined that we really need to build up an intergenerational community center, and that would blend together parks and rec, vet services, um, youth services, and seniors all together in one building. Um, this is a successful model that you, if you go to Lexington, they have a, a wonderful model of that happening. They have like 20% of their population is signed up to do that. I've been in there from 9 to 3, it's busy with seniors doing their thing, and then from 3 to 9, it's busy with the kids coming in as well. So there, there's a plan to do that. Um, there is a, uh, I think the popular choice right now is to build it in a secure park, and that's an active part of the facilities master planning committee. I would probably, in a minority, want it somewhere else, but that's to be discussed later on. Because we're going to have to do that. Thank you. Thank you for asking. <coughs> Is there any other questions? Other questions, I should say. Yes, in the back? Yes, hi. Um, just a quick question is, as a rising senior myself, um, it seems to me that one of the big issues for a lot of people aging in North Reading is, you know, they come here for the schools, houses are all quite large, <laughs> they're not like, there's not a lot of downsizing space here. Is that anything that you guys have considered? So the two questions, so when people are in June, people are going to be sitting there watching the kids graduate, right? And they start asking the questions, um, you know, I've had this great connection with my community on the fields, with, the, with all the clubs, everything else like that. And they start asking the, the question, is there life after kids? And the second question they ask is, do I stay or do I go? Right? And they, they and right now we don't have a downtown, which is what CPC is, you know, what we're going to be working on. We don't have places for to overhouse as many people in seniors in county are living on a fixed income who are overhoused, who can't go anywhere else, and we have to give them anywhere to go. And that is something that, you know, if you look at the, uh, the, the town master plan, which is covering the next two to ten years, it's about housing, it's about creating a community center for adults that adults can enjoy, it's about, you know, having this intergenerational community center being a gathering point for people. We have to do more to reach out to people in town. And so it's a, yeah, it's a, it's, 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 it's many cylinders to make this work. You know, there's been many, uh, you know, there's, it, it takes many aspects to make this all work. And I think we're all getting there. Uh, it's a long-term plan, but I think our goal is to, to make that happen and make the town wonderful for seniors as well. So thanks for asking. I'm sure ask you a quick point. Question. When you say over housed, what do you mean by that? I just know you're 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 property rich in cash flow. And and uh, so we, we have to figure ways to reach out and, uh, and keep them in town. But a lot of people just even maintaining a large home, there's a lot of them. But we haven't given them places to go where they can find a community center where it's walkable, where it's a, a fun place for them to be. We need to we need to do that. And it's not this is not this is not radical thinking. It's being done in many, many places in the country, in Massachusetts especially. Uh, we have an opportunity to do it here. Actually, we have an opportunity because we don't have a downtown. So we can create one. We have the space to do that. At least that's what we Thank you for that clarification. Yes? I'm just curious, did, um, as a military family living in other towns, um, the high school resort or the high school itself building in previous towns have used it for adult education. And when you talk about trying to keep adults and seniors in, has there ever been talk about using our awesome high school building for adult education classes? Um, because I'm just curious, that might be something that if you're paying into the tax system and everybody says, I don't have to the school system, but if they have education opportunities at the high school in the evening for adults, It is. It is. I can answer that one. Okay, I can. I can answer too. We'll go for it. Yeah. 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 
Um, I wasn't sure if you were aware. Yeah, no, I, I am. Um, so there is a, um, out in uh, Swarmska, they did a combined senior center next to the high school. The attempt to do that does not have, does not work well. Um, there's rules about using the school. It's, um, you know, there's, there's issues of uh, paying for it, how you fund it, and everything else like that. So what I heard, doesn't mean we couldn't explore it, but um, it, we really need to give a space for the intergenerational community center that's separate from the schools. Um, the, the only thing I add to that is I've had experience <coughs> in two communities I've lived in. And I'm just saying, you know, these times have changed and, you know, taxes and, and so, again, I don't know what it is, but these were evening classes, anything from finances for senior citizens to wine tasting to um, art classes, and they were, I wouldn't say volunteers, they were probably given a stipend of some sort that was, that was included in the cost, and they were evening classes that were in a facility that wasn't being used. So they weren't in the gym, but they were in classrooms and the art. So I, I just bring that up as a possible yeah. I know exactly what you're talking about. I've done classes like that elsewhere, Wakefield. Um, so great thing to explore. Appreciate that. And, and we can explore that. Can I just add one thing to that as well? So, um, you know, the, the three things that seniors want to be happy in their communities, they want to live in their house as long as they can, they want to live in their community as long as they can, and they want to lead a life of purpose. Now in Western Mass, there's this thing called the tree house, and what they have is when the kids get out of school, it's kind of like a boys and girls stuff, they, they have seniors waiting for them and to work with them to do tutoring and do things like that. And this is, we have this great opportunity, and the success rate of that is off the charts. Everybody's happy because the seniors are happy to help the kids. The parents are happy because they're getting tutoring out of school. Right, and I, I can understand that. We can have, I think, both, right? Yeah, right. Both. So we Absolutely. have this beautiful school that, again, I, 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 I hear from neighbors who are elderly that I'm paying taxes to the school and I can't even, you know, there's nothing right. for me. And this, again, it's just an idea that they're out there. Yeah. Yeah, listen, the public services director, yeah, well. the, the public services director, one of their main things is pull together all these different yes. departments, library, parks and rec, all these people, right. but also to make a safe home. And that's it. Do we have any additional questions? Yes? Yeah, I have a question. Um, I haven't been attending as many select board meetings as I would like to. I'm curious on your take on um, the ARPA funds what the plan is for the money that's coming into the town, what what are the best uses for those funds? Yes? Is that it? I was trying to clarify the funds they were talking about. Is ARC, uh, is that what you said? The ARC, the American Rescue Plan Act funds. Oh, so like the ESSER funds and those kinds of things. Uh, like federal ARC funds. Yeah. Is that, that's inclusive of the ESSER funds and those those types of things. Like ESSER 3, which is private, so it's me and my correct or no? It's hard to hear you right here. Oh, sorry. That's, I'm never here. People say that to me. Um, <laughs> this, so I was just trying to clarify if that is related to the ESSER funds, the ESSER 2 and 3 funds. Is that part of the whole thing? Well, 
government gave to the states tons of money that the state is dispersing from the pandemic? It's COVID. I, I understand that. So it's not related to ESSER at all. That they're not. ESSER, ESSER, ESSER funds. ESSER's for, ESSER for the school for COVID. So it's part of the overall. It's COVID, but it's not school. Okay. So ARP is the part of it that's not school. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Unfortunately, we're not getting the $500 million across the state. No. Okay. Thank you. Yes? I do have a question for Lena. Um, so there was something recently that we have different months for everything that we celebrate. There's something for the veterans and the first responders. I don't think a lot of people know about it. Yeah, oh, thank you for asking. Um, yes, I did bring forward. Can you um, can you, oh, she asked if there was um, any, there are, there are months that are given to a proclamation for, um, like there's the Pride Day month. Um, and I brought forward, she said, was there anything for the veterans? And yes, I have brought forward a, a proclamation for the veterans. October is now Veterans Month in North Reading every year. Um, we have Pride Month. Pride Month was brought forward, I believe. Yep, that's, that was you, right? Um, or June. Yeah, for a team. Yeah, I have to do with that. And yeah, I am actually working on first responders because they don't speak to be a lot better. So, um, yeah, so thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to of communication and ideas and what the heal that uh, that's going on for the community. I thank you both. Good luck, I hope you win. <laughs>
and manage large, complicated bu budgets, using those to make even more complicated decisions, and to put long-term goals into action. I have written policies that have created a positive impact on my workplaces. I have been part of union negotiations, hiring, re reviews, and disciplinary processes. I want to use these skills to make more threatening school systems a better place for all of our kids. I think all this experience makes me qualified for the job of being a member of the school committee. I think what separates me from some of the other candidates is that I've attended most of the school committee meetings in the entirety of the year since I ran last year. I have done advocacy work inside our town and outside for eight years. I attended my first IEP meeting for my son about 11 years ago. I have both supported and disagreed with the school administration. I have done that while building strong relationships, founded on respect, while creating an environment where members of the staff and administrative administration have reached out to me for my opinion in making policy decisions surrounding um, my advocacy work. I am committed to using all these skills and experience to build the strongest possible future for all of our kids.
example, when we talked about the superintendent, we talked about uh, the, the role of the school community in hiring the superintendent. It goes beyond that. Okay. I'm just going to stop you for one second because I'm getting a text that they want you to be closer to the mic. <coughs> they can't hear you as well, and they want to hear you. People watching. From oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. I just I want them to be able to hear you. I, I naturally told them too loud, so that's the first time ever. <laughs> you have a lot of studio. I don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> Saturday night live, I'll be fine. Um, so, what I was saying is that the, the role of hiring the superintendent doesn't stop at the at the edge of okay, the person's hired and that's it. There's an oversight. Uh, there's an oversight role here as well. It's making sure that the three and five year goals that the superintendent comes in with, and and that contract is actually been renewed for another several years. Uh, making sure those goals are being met. Making sure we're on track. Are there gaps? What, what works to actually fill those gaps? We obviously work on budget, and the budget impacts very practical things when it comes to our kids' education, classroom sizes. It, it, it impacts the number of uh, activities that get offered. What are the fees that, uh, that are associated with it? What is the cost of a uh, full day kindergarten, which the, the town did a good job of, of actually reducing? But it's it's all of those practical things that go into it that actually small decisions become bigger decisions that all of which have practical impact to our kids. And, and the thing I'm actually going to leave on is is really we've talked about it in, in past discussions about well how do we get great teachers and how do we keep great teachers and how do we how do we make sure that we can find a diverse set of teachers as well. And to me, it all comes down to a very practical answer. And, and it's really, how do, we, how do we stop teachers going to other school districts? How do we stop a middle school science teacher from going to a, a nearby school district because they're getting more pay? It really comes down to two things. From my experience, it's making sure there's a contract that is advantageous to the teachers. And again, we've done a very good job with that in the past. Uh, of trying to bring them up to what the other communities are paying. If you offer competitive pay, people aren't going to leave because they're, they're getting paid more elsewhere. So making sure that the steps and the, the eventual uh, pay is really on par with, with other districts. You've got to keep that going. It's not just a one-time contract. The other thing is, once they're here, if you want to keep them here, if you want to attract the, the best people, you give them the right resources, and more importantly, you get out of their way. You let them do what they do best. Teachers, from my experience, having married an educator uh, and having known several, but I mean, uh, other people I'm sure have great experiences too, will tell you they don't enter the job thinking, wow, I hope I get micromanaged. Do any of us do any job thinking we're going to get micromanaged and, and get joy out of that? They do the job because they know they can do it and they know they are motivated for it. So let them do their jobs. And that's really part of our role, is to make sure they have the resources to be able to do that without our interference in their day-to-day -day classroom, but yet have the things they need to successfully accomplish their job. So with that, I will, I will close by saying, uh, it's not my quote, but uh, I'll steal it anyway, saying, uh, decisions are made by those who participate. Please come out and vote on May 3rd. Uh, please use all your votes. <laughs> there are two votes for, for school committee. Please use both of them because it is important and because we do feel it's important. So thank you. Okay, next is uh, Crystal O'Mara. Oh, I'm sorry. O'Mara. O'Mara.
My husband and I moved to North Reading 10 years ago because we wanted to be a part of a community that had a highly ranked school system, knowing we would grow our family here. I'm a proud mother of two sons, Tyler is in the second grade at the little school, and Zachary is in preschool at the Hood Elementary School. The COVID pandemic closed our schools and forced parents to participate in our children's education. In collaboration with a few other first grade parents, we decided to create a pause learning environment where we helped deliver the daily lesson plans and create a fun environment where our children could socialize and be excited to learn. This is an example of the level of commitment I would give as a school committee member to bring our faculty, students, parents, and community members together to ensure excellence in student achievement. This experience opened my eyes to how important it is to help, support, and preserve our public education. A little bit about my background, I attended UMass Dartmouth and earned a Bachelor of Science degree in Human Resource Management and Finance. After graduating college, I worked at Children's Hospital Boston and enjoyed being part of a team that made a difference in many lives. I furthered my career into the retail banking industry where I became an effective branch manager for many years. These experiences have strengthened my leadership and financial skills that I can apply to challenges and offer problem-solving strategies to meet the needs of the teachers, the administration, students, school budgets, and also the school district goals. I've been involved with the low school PTO since Tyler started kindergarten. I'm the treasurer on their board and I am committed to accuracy, transparency, and timeliness to maintain the finances and set the budget. Education is one of our most important community investments and our school committee's actions affect our town's reputation. Our children need us and they need our support to foster their growth into becoming creative, responsible, knowledge, and kind individuals who are prepared to face today's ever-changing world. Thank you. Thank you, Christopher. Okay, last but not least, uh, we have Noel Brennan.
So why did I decide to jump in and join the fray of this year's school committee race? Um, I think my one of my biggest strengths, and people who know me will agree, that I'm a collaborator and a bridge builder. Uh, I can listen to people voice their opinions and concerns with empathy and move everyone towards uh, logical and fact-based conclusions. Um, I am diplomatic. Uh, John's no longer here, but he spoke of being Switzerland as moderator. I like to think of myself in Switzerland, Switzerland in a lot of ways, too. Um, I do not feel that um, national politics belongs in small town business, um, especially on a school committee. Um, I feel really strongly about engaging stakeholders, whether they be students, families, teachers, um, and the administration, and, and working together to collaborate with them. Um, and as I mentioned before, I have worked um, in uh, grant funded projects in the past, so I have experience with managing budgets within a um, pretty small um, limit and working creatively with budgets um, and using limited funds. Um, also, um, a note about the budget and um, what Rich Walner, um, what Rich Walner was speaking of earlier. Um, and the importance of being cognizant of the fact that we are, the school budget is funded by taxpayers and a lot of um, which are um, taxpayers who no longer have children in the schools. Um, in my work, in my research work, I did a lot of um, different uh, focus groups and qualitative research at different councils on aging across the state and um, one of my passions is actually um, geriatrics and working with older adults. So I do think that as a school committee member, even though I'm working for the schools with kids, I think it's important to be cognizant of the um, fact that we are using taxpayer money and that um, it's, a, it's a big budget that we're operating. And always to be mindful of, of the people that are really working hard to stay in the work setting, the older adults. Sorry, I'm going to pick up my mom again, but she's She's wanting to stay in North Reading, and it's tough. <coughs> As we all know, the tax rate is high, so I think that's important to be mindful of that, um, even you know, as a school committee member. Um, anyhow, uh, a, a little bit more about why I decided to run. Um, it's been a really tough few years. I'm so happy um, and grateful to move on, and that the, the pandemic is in our rear view mirror. I really want to help us move on from that. From a lot of our kids went through a lot. Um, they need to recover academically, um, emotionally, um, and we need to move on. Um, I'm very passionate about education, about maintaining really strict academic standards, merit-based education, um, and encouraging healthy discourse and faith. Um, I believe in a strong classic foundation to education, including literature, science. Civics, critical thinking, um, and I'm also very passionate about supporting the arts as well. Um, so, again, I think of myself as a bridge builder. I would like to model and encourage an environment of resilience and unity and help the students of North Reading to create a common culture where they are seen and valued and feel as um, an essential member of the. Um, So I just, just wanted to let you know that, okay? 
and, and, and if you and if you do vote for him, then that won't, uh, because he's already said uh, notifying the town clerk that he's not running, that, that vote would not be uh, counted. And if he were to win, then that seat would not be filled. And if that seat's not filled, I believe that would fall into the hands of the select board at that point. Okay, that's based on my conversation with the town clerk. So, um, Jeff, that is not what she's recently yeah. told us. Because we also inquired, and we were told that basically if he does win a seat, he can accept or decline. That's not what, okay, then this con, that's what I, she I just want, I, Yeah, I just want to clear up. Hi, I'm the person that actually went to town. Yep. And I well, I did too. I spoke to him one-on-one. -on -one. No, so, <laughs> so yeah, that's what we're trying to get to. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But that's, that's, what she, that's the way she explained it to me. Yeah. Yeah. So, what And I wanted, and I asked to see, because it's public knowledge, if John submitted a written request. And he, there, none exists as of yesterday. But it doesn't matter because he didn't submit it before the deadline. The deadline was March 31st, and he did not submit it then. So he can say whatever he wants to say, but he will still be on the ballot. And he, if he has the vote, if he's the first, the highest, the second highest, he will still be able to go on the school committee if he chooses to do so. And she did tell me that, which is my face. And I'm not trying to tell you a lie, but that is actual facts. <laughs> what if he declines? What if, what if he declines? If he wants to decline, I'm pretty sure I looked it up, there's a law that supports this. And it says that you have six consecutive days to write a written letter, sign it, get it notarized, and pass it into the town board. Now, I think the school committee does have an issue, can do something maybe with, I don't know, I've heard something about, I don't know. There's some, I think I'd ask about Buckley to ask. I think, I think it's a, if he declines, I believe it's a joint selection of the select board and yeah, the school committee. Yeah, that's, that's, that's the next step. step right? yes. 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 It would be a joint selection of the school committee and the select board. Right. So there was some confusing information there. Um, uh, so, do I have any questions for the school candidates? Now, this is Q&A. Question and answer. Ask and listen. I see a wild hand going up on the <laughs> <laughs> oh. No, I do have two. I have, I have, I have two. I was just kidding. That's what I do when I want to talk. <laughs> I, I have two questions for, for each of the candidates. Uh, uh, please. There's two separate questions. And I, my, my first question is, and they're pretty much pretty similar. I, I would like to hear each candidate's position on and if elected what actions they would take involving <coughs> curriculum choices at our schools. And the second question is I would like to hear what each candidate's position is on what books we have in our school libraries, all of our school libraries, and if elected, what you would be doing, what actions each of the candidates would be doing in terms of either censoring, removal, or otherwise with regard to library books that are available for our students. Did you guys get that? How much time do you have? So the, the first thing, the first question is specific curriculum. Uh, in, in my opinion, the, and my answer can be similar though. Uh, in my opinion, the school board should not be making specific curriculum decisions. So um, something something that I I mean I would love to be an AP English teacher. I would love that. That would be awesome. Um, but for me I a, a not qualified and B it's not the job that I'm being hired for. If you go back even even look at the, the minutes from the last year of meetings, to my knowledge there's never been a vote on a specific book or curriculum choice in a, in a classroom. And and I'll go a little further than that in saying, I, I don't think you want us to do that. It's this very slippery slope very quickly for me to say, my daughter doesn't like long division. It's like, if I have long division, Newtonian physics, I mean, we're talking about it in the context of, of diversity and, and more flashpoint issues, but it, there's no limit to that. There's no law that says, we talk about, we can enter curriculum on some topics, but not others. So. What's to prevent me from saying goodbye evolution, you know, goodbye history of colonialism in, uh, in Europe? So for me, pretty obviously, I, I don't think that's where we get involved, in my opinion. Um, 
second thing is, same thing on books. You know, I, I don't think there should be up or down votes on which books. Obviously, if there's specific issues on specific books that violate something else in state law or federal law, someone should bring it forward. But that's really the principle. Or it's the superintendent that really would oversee that first, again, in my opinion. But we shouldn't be up or down voting specific books. So I'll, I'll leave it there after that long winded answer. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Do you want the audio curriculum and then, or, oh, both of them. Okay. Um, so, how do you want to answer? Oh, yeah. <laughs> and board report. Yeah. <laughs> so, I think, you know, being part of the committee is, um, you know, it, it's about um, consensus building. You know, each of us is just one member if we were to get on of the, you know, multiple member committee. And, um, my, I mean, for a curriculum, again, like to Jeff, I'm not. Or that's not, I listed what I've done in my past and that is not it. Um, I think mean, I do want our kids to be, I hope the curriculum would support reading, teaching kids how to read and write and math. Um, we want our kids to be smart, I believe, once they get out. Um, so as far as like my opinion, that, that's my opinion on that. Um, I think they should definitely learn about the history and what's happened. Um, we can't, we shouldn't be, um, you know, our past of the history of our America is what it is and I think everyone should learn about that um, in the age appropriate. Um, but I definitely don't think that as a school committee member, we have, I don't think it's even in the role for us to pick and choose the curriculum. Um, I think, again, it's more like Jeff said, if there's a particular issue, something that, like a student, a teacher, a parent, we all maybe could all get together and talk about it if there's a problem and collaborate with administration um, to solve that problem and work how we can make changes um, for that. But it's definitely not something that I think we can just decide on our own for. Um, and then books is kind of the same thing. I mean, I sadly I haven't probably been in the library in a long time. Um, <laughs> so there's that. Um, I probably should though. And I know Katie is at the library, so I should probably go visit her and do that. That's on the list. Um, so I mean, as far as again, I think it's the library is the same thing. If someone has a problem and they can bring it forward to us and feel comfortable in that space. And again, that, you know, for the whole committee and work with the administration and go from there. But um, I, I wouldn't go picking books out, I guess. Hi there. Okay, so we'll start with curriculum. Um, first off, I would say that I um, have a great deal of faith in our teachers and our administration. Um, I've said before that every year I think that I couldn't get luckier with the teachers that I have gotten, or my kids have gotten, but, um, and it, I'm, I've been proved wrong many times. So we have amazing teachers and they are light years above what I, what I could do in terms of teaching, and I'm so grateful for that. Um, and I also, with the administration, I was lucky enough to have my kids start at the batch under um, Sean Colleen, who's now um, moved on to administration um, for the whole district. And I was so, I was sad to see him go, but I was really grateful that, we're, that um, my kids are gonna have his influence all the way through high school, because I have a lot of trust in um, Dr. Daly and Mr. Colleen, and I, I do think that their job is their educators. Now, in terms of curriculum choice, Certainly, I, I think it's interesting to, to be apprised of it um, and to review it, but it's not my place to choose or select. Um, and say, same thing with, with, with books. Um, I think that literature is so very important for teaching us lessons um, from, from a current time, um, historical, I mean, it is deeply important. Um, you know, um, one of my um, friends here was speaking about how, um, you know, you teach history with the warts included. There's a lot of literature that has the warts included, and I don't think that that should be limited or taken away. Um, if there was something specific that was inappropriate, um, or somehow, um, especially age inappropriate, I mean, I have young kids, so I mean, that's sort of, I'm thinking of that in some way then that, I believe, would be brought up to the superintendent and us as, as the school committee to review. But I would certainly never 
never condone going after specific books unless there was a specific issue. Um, books are my one of my greatest loves, so I don't want to go after books. <laughs> um, sure, thanks. Um, I think that we touched on a lot of good points, so, um, but I think my opinion is that the role that school committee plays in curriculum is in funding curriculum. Um, I think that a lot of times that, you know, if we want there to see changes, like updated and how we're teaching different subjects, that's where we come in. It's not selecting the exact curriculum, but saying like we will support this being updated to reflect whatever new things are coming up in all different kinds of, in science, in mathematics, in you know civics, whatever is happening, we need to make sure that there's budget for the kids to have a, as current as possible, um, curriculum, and I think that's where the role of school committee plays in curriculum, not necessarily selecting it, but making sure teachers have access to the best curriculum to teach um, students the most up-to-date information that's available. In terms of books, I think books are awesome, and I am a huge fan, and I think that, you know, um, you know, my kids take books out of the library, and as, as, at the middle school, well, mostly my daughter, my son would not choose to read a book for fun, but my daughter loves reading, and she's read about a million different things, and I think that it's important that kids have access to books that make them think about things differently, make them question things, have conversations with their parents, do all of those things. So I think it's super important that they have the ability to read about things that they are seeing in their world, and, and it helps them you know, formulate ideas about it and to think critically. Um, and so it, I wouldn't want to have a say in everything that she read because I want her to hear other people's viewpoints in all the ways that she possibly can. Yes, in the back.
and we have young kids in the system, and we may not have it, but there are other school systems that have that we know in Massachusetts, and so parents just want to have transparency so they can have conversations with their kids. So, so your, your question is, do you feel do the parents that, have the right? that parents have a right to transparency and to know what's being taught in the schools and to be able to opt out if they find it objectionable okay. based on faith, age of inappropriateness, moral or ethical values? Okay. Thank and, you. and I will add to this that we are a room of mixed people, and yet I'm friends with a lot of people here on different ends of the spectrum. And I think we need to be able to to acknowledge that we're all different and allow, the school shouldn't be raising our kids, we should, and let's have, right. be able to have a conversation Again, I do think that there are um, things 
posed to kids for a reason. Um, I do think, again, we need to have, I do like the word transparency. We need to be able to talk to our kids about what they're being taught. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean some sort of a divisive conversation. I don't see that at all. Um, I just, um, I, you know, I, I would like to be able to discuss things with, with um, you know, teachers and things like that. Just an opting out. Um, oh goodness. Um, I just, I just don't see unless something is especially maybe going against someone's religious values or something. I just, I, I don't see a situation where opting out is necessarily appropriate. But I'm, you know, please give me the grace to someday maybe change my opinion on that. But I don't, I don't necessarily think. Again, I have a lot of trust in the teachers and the, in the administration. And what they're what they're needing to do. So, but. I think I'm going to start backwards and go with opt out because that's fresh in my brain. Um, the one thing I, I feel like opt out could do is <coughs> yeah, be the child that felt left out if they were removed from a certain subject. And then how do they feel they're not working with their classmates? I mean, if they had that option, I just think that's something to consider as well. Um, I mean, my kids are really young, preschool and second grade, and most of my oldest in school has been primarily at home with me. So, um, I mean, I think there should be transparency for sure. I think parents, um, you know, you, you have your children, they're your child until they're 18, and I think that um, they, to be able to talk to the teacher um, if they feel something's different. Um, but it's definitely hard for any school committee member or any, I mean, anyone of us, or any school committee member to be in the classroom, obviously, all the time. Um, you know, I think it's definitely, it's just a conversation that needs to be had amongst everyone. Um, that's the call. So I'll give you a short answer or long answer. Uh, short answer is yes and no. Um, first answer, yes, as in transparency is, is obviously important. I think if anybody, uh, if anybody doesn't think that, that getting some sort of transparency from, from uh, the school is important, then that's, that's fine. For me and in our family, we like to preview things with our daughter. We like to, we like to talk about things with, with our family and find out what's going on. We've never had an issue with that. Um, I'm not sure if that has been an ongoing issue, um, and maybe it is, but, but certainly we haven't seen it. But transparency, I'm not gonna get the, the legal elements of it. I don't consider myself a legal expert on 20 USC 1232H, uh, or any of the others that I've, I've been recently reading about. Um, yeah, there, there is a lot out there about some of this, but again, I'm not gonna pretend like I'm an expert on that. The second piece of it uh, is where I want to focus a little bit more on the opt-out. No, um, and I want to come back to the role of school committee. It's I, I can't imagine even first of all, in a practical sense, but who would be the arbiter of appropriateness? Uh, certainly, I, I can't imagine the five of us uh, or whoever's on voting saying this would be appropriate, that wouldn't. That would be. I mean, I, I can't imagine myself qualified in any sense to do that, and I'm not really sure we want you to do that. Um, the second piece of it, though, is, again, we talk about opting in and opting out, the, the moral elements of it, like there's a single issue that would do that, like a single look or a single subject. Again, slippery slope. I, I have a moral objection to Newtonian physics. S equals one half at T squared is gone. I just, I, it, it's, absurd to think that, but there's no control over it. There's no governing law, there's nothing that I've ever read or seen that would say the school committee can, opt, can govern often in or out of specific topics. Uh, I just can't imagine having that level of control. I might be the only potential, uh, the only uh, candidate for, for elected office to say, don't give me that power. I don't want that much power. Because uh, I can't imagine what I would do with it. Uh, but that's that's my answer. The short answer is yes and no. Hi, I'm Jessica Hall. I'm 
my watch out, watch out, children are in third grade. Uh, if you went into all the third grade classrooms, they wouldn't be identical. The teachers are teaching slightly differently, and they have different modes of teaching, they have different styles of teaching, and they find those individual styles effective. But the overall curriculum, in other words, the MCAS that they're teaching to, is all the same. You know, I, I as a parent, I, I will say, you know, person writing, really? I mean, I mean, that's my personal feeling, but yet I also know that is part of the curriculum. Um, and my job as a parent to advocate and say, wow, do I really want that going, doesn't impact whether or not that's actually part of the curriculum, because it is. Um, and, you know, that, that really is top down, and something that if, if we really get a movement and you want to change something, that's the way to change it. But the classroom, there's an independent style, but curriculum really comes exactly as they're saying, a Desi to superintendent, assistant superintendent, down through the schools. And does Desi get it from the Department of Education, the federal government? No. no. We, like, we, yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, that's part of it. I mean, I think where you're going with this is, I, I think where you're going with this is, is at least what I'm hearing is partly like Common Core, that sort of thing. I mean, yeah, there, there are parts of that as well. Uh, there are, again, having done a little bit of, a tiny bit of, of research on this, there are federal laws on, on these sorts of things, for sure. Um, but states, from again, from what my knowledge of it, seem to have a pretty good bit of freedom in that, too. And again, Anything they want. You know, I can see one state go wildly off and say, you know, we're forget that. We're not gonna we're not gonna teach anything having to do with what any of the other states are doing. But I don't think you want that. I don't. I don't. I think what we're all advocating for is something similar. And there's we all want a standardized uh, education. We all want our kids to have a great standardized education, public education. And to go beyond that, you're starting to think, okay, if that's not the route to go, maybe. You know, not advocating private school, not advocating homeschooling, but if you're looking at something so radical, that is the departure. Homeschooling and private school is not radical. Well, I'm not, I'm not, I didn't mean to imply that. <laughs> Thank I, I, you. Sorry. I appreciate it. No, yeah. no, that's okay. I just wanted to add that. I mean, I'm just saying. As a better homeschool mom, yeah. I just wanted okay. to say it's <laughs> not that radical. No, sorry. Yeah, I you're not that out there. Backwards, I'm sorry. Out there. Thank you. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Does anybody else have a question? The gentleman in the back. That's you. You are a gentleman. Right. You're of age now. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, my name is Noah Spicer, uh, student of North Reading Schools, son of students of North Reading Schools. Um, I have a question about the fees that are involved with different student programs throughout our public schools. Uh, for most of high school, uh, I was not able to park at the high school due to parking fees, couldn't afford them. Um, I'm lucky that I was able to afford athletic fees uh, and able to compete in athletic uh, competitions at the schools, but um, a lot of students aren't. And my dad was able to compete in North Reading Public Schools on the athletic teams. He eventually earned a scholarship, which paid for a college education he would not have been able to otherwise afford. Uh, if he had gone to school in North Reading today, he would not have been able to pay those fees. He would not have gotten that athletic experience and possibly wouldn't have been able to get the scholarship he later earned. Um, do we have any, uh, what I'm trying to ask the school committee is, is there a way that we can ensure that students are still able to get the opportunities that they might not get if they can't afford? I understand that there are support mechanisms, but I still believe students are dissuaded from certain opportunities if they can't afford them in this town. And, and before I turn it over to them, quick question, when your dad went to school, did he have to pay any fees? Do you know? Not athletic fees, he did not. No, no athletic fees, so no. that's a more of a modern time yes. uh, issue uh, thing, right? Okay, that, I just wanted to uh, yep. clarify that. I know when I went to school, I didn't have to pay any fees, so, yep. you know, but that was a long time. Anybody <coughs> want to answer that? Yeah, I'm just going to say, I think that's 
answer that question from the other line.
On the other side of it, you know, for adults, if we're, we want to go to the gym, we pay a gym membership. Um, it's not free for everyone, but there's that. Um, I do know in taxes, everyone household pays different amounts of taxes, and we're all getting the same education. So there's that that plays into it, too. Um, just thinking outside the box. So I do think fees help pay for the activity that's happening. I definitely don't think it should be, you know, only the kids that can afford it, that can play it. There should be help for um, those kids that can have it happen on their own with so the funding and fundraisers. But I mean, there definitely needs, someone needs to be paying also for, or help pay for all of these extracurricular activities that we're offering. Means testing. <laughs> um, it, it, it does make some sense. Uh, I mean, if you can afford to pay, uh, that's great. And if you can't, then, then having some opportunities to participate. I'm not a huge fan, as I've spoken in the back, and in the past, uh, about having opportunity and inclusion for activities. Uh, my daughter swims and skates and plays soccer and likes theater and wants to learn how to play instrument. Um, I, I will say when I, believe it or not, I actually played sports and I don't look like it. Um, a long time ago, we did actually have fees. Um, and, and even back then, I, I thought it was odd, but obviously there are expenses that go into these. And there are hard choices that have to be, that have to be made when you think about a budget. Pay for, pay for user fees, have another adjustment counselor. Or do we reduce the cost of kindergarten, which is also about inclusion? Um, I, I actually don't mind the concept of, uh, of means testing. Uh, I think it would have to be really, it, it's much more complicated than, and I don't, I don't think anybody's oversimplifying it. Um, I, I think it's a little more complicated than just doing that, but I, I certainly think it, it could be worth a look at, assuming you know, that's something that's been done in other towns. I've looked at others for guidance on that. See where what other towns have done for inclusion, um, and see what a is permissible and b because you know it, it's not as simple as just saying what is a means test um, to make sure it's fair. So I, I would look to see what other towns have done for that sort of thing. Um, but it, these are very difficult decisions because money from one place not to go is valuable uh, to someone else or to something else. So uh, anyway, thank you. Great question. <coughs> That was a, a very, very key question to be asking because there are a lot of children in North America who cannot afford to play in sports. And it's the have versus the have not kind of scenario. And then you have the issue as well, we include all the sports and all the theater into the, into the cost of education and the taxpayers have to figure out who's going to pay for that. So uh, it's a very tough uh, uh, issue. Uh, but hopefully, if you guys would do that. <laughs> so, uh, but is there any, I'm going to take one more question because we're getting kind of late. Uh, yes? So, we need at least one COVID question, <coughs> right? Um, and hopefully it will be a short one because it, it, it should be a yes or no, or maybe. So, um, so, fortunately and very happily, the pandemic is winding down. We have still have variants but they get less and less virulent. I know that um, Dr. Daly has expressed a desire to have vaccines at an 80% rate across the district. So I'd like to know what you, how you feel about that. The second question though, it's related is, if now we're relaxing with the uh, masks, so it's nice to see everybody's faces today, um, but, how do you feel about if, if we start getting another variant, like something like AB2 or AB3, right? How do you feel about reimposing the mask mandate? Should they be mandated or optional at every grade level? I'm not just, I'm talking preschool to 12th grade. And how do each of you feel about that? That would be throughout the system. Throughout the system, right. yeah. So, so two, two points, how I feel about the, the 80% uh, as a guideline. Um, I, I will say to encourage people to, to get vaccinated is great. Is it mandated? Is it, should it be mandated that 80% of the town get that? I think that's a 
different discussion that we <laughs> will have no control over whatsoever. Not the town, um, the schools. The, well, the schools. Yeah. Uh, well, e either way, I don't think the school committee is going to be going to be saying or mandating uh, a level. I think that would still come down from from a, a state guideline rather than us dictating. Again, my opinion, us dictating what a level or or some level of mandatory uh, uh, vaccination. Um, and, you know, I, I'm certainly not qualified uh, as not a virologist, uh, infectious disease specialist, or public health specialist. I, I would, to me, listen to the state because they have specialists and, and knowledge on that that I just am not going to have. Uh, second part is uh, about masks. And to me, I'll, I'll go back to say, you know, depends on the facts of it and depends on the people deciding uh, that are more knowledgeable than me on the same topic. Uh, funny, I had this discussion even at work today. Facts dictate conclusions. Um, if, if facts change such that someone says uh, a mask is effective and efficient and that's the way it's going to go and therefore we should be doing it, I'm going to listen to people who, who actually have that understanding much more than me and I'll give you an example. I'm going to give you, I'll give two extreme examples, two extreme hypothetical examples. Sorry, it's a yes or no question, and then I'm going to do it. Um, uh, if I said there was a, an elective surgery that someone had to do, and someone heard me say this hypothetical before, and, and we said our kid had to have elective surgery, it's a no-brainer. Uh, if the hospital said, we're, we're not really going to require masks in the operating room, we'd say, are you kidding? And, and, and I say that because it obviously it's an absurd example. Um, but I say that because the facts dictate the conclusion in a surgery. Of course, that makes sense. Of course, that's going to prevent uh, infection. That, that makes sense. The facts of what is the, uh, the variant, I'm hoping and, and think that those who would look at that, again, much more knowledgeable than me, would take facts into account and say, is this, how virulent is it? How, how what is the mortality rate? What is it? all of those things that would go into it? That again, I'm not going to play statistician on. Um, they will take that into account. So yes, it could be. So so to be direct, yes, it, it could happen again. But it would depend on the facts uh, of the situation and what people are more knowledgeable than you would uh, dictate on that. Okay. So for the vaccination part, I think that is something that heads up from the Board of Health and from the superintendent. So I don't know how much a school committee is agreeing on that. Um, and then as far as masks, I think masks should be optional.
that 80% of any school building has to be vaccinated. It has literally nothing. He has no cost role in that whatsoever. He was following guidelines. And I understand that for some folks, not following, following guidelines is optional, but the reality of the situation is that that is how we get money for our schools. So forget sports. If we want to still have math, we have to follow the guidelines. <laughs> So um, I think that that's the answer to the first question, um, is that I don't think that uh, Dr. Daly had any role in that 80% number. And I think that it's important that um, we provide families that are looking for opportunities to be vaccinated, those opportunities. In terms of whether or not I think that we should go back to requiring masks for anyone, again, this is sort of like, if you would ask any of us running three years ago for these same seats, if we were ever gonna require masks, Say no. The world is a complicated place. I am not going to make a promise that no circumstance happens in which I would never um, like be on board with requiring masks. But those circumstances involve important doctors at the CDC and the Department of Health making that recommendation for all of our kids. Um, I'm always for listening to people who you know know more about these things than I do. And I'm just going to take two quick points of personal privilege. One is if you didn't get your answer, get questions, get to ask your question, feel free to talk to me afterwards. I don't know if these other just lovely candidates would like to do the same, but I know there were some hands raised when we did our last question. And lastly, I just want to be clear about means testing. I am 100% against means testing. And I, I just think that asking someone to prove their poorness to me is really insulting. And I would never, I'd rather it be flat keys and, you know, <coughs> but saying you have to show me your, you, you have to prove to me that you really truly can't afford this. I don't trust your own personal judgment about whether or not you can afford this. It's truly insulting to people who don't have the same resources as us. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, it's been a very uh, informative evening. I, I do have a question. So I want to clarify something here, if we, if we can. Um, as the circumstances regarding John Barrett, John Barrett is not here. He was invited to be here, and he said he would be here, but I received notice from John Barrett that he was not running for the school. So I, I'm hoping with Michelle here that she would be able to clarify the status of John Barrett. Uh, He's as well. not running. He's not running. <laughs> okay. Great. Okay, so we're clear on that. All right? So um, I want to thank you all for coming. I want to thank all the candidates, all the incumbents, everybody for um, doing, uh, uh, standing up and willing to take these tough questions. I often wish. I didn't do this because I kind of would like to be in that. Because every time I heard a question and answer, I want to go like that. You know? so, but um, uh, you asked hard questions. I said they would be hard questions. And I thank you all for being here. And I think this was a real, real plus for the North Valley. Thank you all very, very much.